This fashion cycles today, that's why there's so much burnout in the industry. You know, we're expected to refresh and renew every eight weeks a brand new, fresh collection for the floor set. You know, and when you're doing four runway shows a year, you know, you never stop. And yeah. you're working on usually a crossover of three seasons all at once. Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today we are speaking with Ashley Tyler, and I'm really excited you're here today because you have a pretty incredible uh, resume. So you went Thank to you Parsons School of Design in New York. Uh, you're owner of your own company, Ashley Tyler, a fashion startup in New York. Um, and then you were senior designer, or senior design director for Ralph Lauren, mm -hmm. senior design director for Levi's Women, and head of design for Benetton, men's, women's, kids, everything. Most recently, yes. Yeah, the, those are some seriously influential um, and major brands that uh, I'm really interested to hear. Uh -huh. um, kind of the, the, not inner workings, but just how you approach design, how those companies approach design, how those companies worked when they're designing. And you, you shared with me just a little bit the other day mm -hmm. about what you would envision starting out and all that. So I'm really excited to get into that. Um, a little bit of background just between Ashley and I, you own the studio next to mine or That's rent right. the studio next to mine. Just popped in the other day as you were going by. That's right. Said hi. And I was like, geez, with your background, we should really have a conversation because that, that could be pretty interesting. Um, and I've known you for a while, just acquaintances for a while. That's right. Uh, you, Im you immortalized me for the cover <laughs> of uh, Maine Magazine, I think back in what, 2011, 2012? Yeah, that was, a, <laughs> that was a while ago, wasn't it? Yeah, and it you were was. just coming back from Bali or something after being there for a while or something, um, right? I had yet to do my Bali... Indonesia tour. Oh, you were about that to go was, over. No, I was about to go move to San Francisco to head up Levi's. Oh, okay. See, as a okay. senior design position. But I didn't know that at the time. And you, you've had <laughs> this... Did we shoot in this studio? No, we shot in my studio. Next, next door. door. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, and you've had that studio forever just because rent in Biddeford's, you, you can't give it. that I up. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't get, you know, spaces like this anymore. You know, yeah, it's, it's great. Like, like, just off camera here, there's one, two, three, four, five. Beautiful big windows, south-facing, like, hardwood floors, columns. Yeah, like almost 20-foot ceilings. We're just giving and John Tarbox a big plug right Yeah, now. right. He still accommodates the artists. <laughs> yes, it's, it's very cool. Um, so anyways, uh, tell me about your your background and how you've oh. gone through these different life experiences okay. like that, and then we'll get into design I'll, and everything I'll as well. I'll give you a quick glimpse into my journey and how I ended up uh, in New York as a Texas girl. Um, Texas. Yeah. I keep running into the Maine-Texas connection. Yeah, you know, I mean, and then I keep coming back to Maine now. Maine is my home, like a homing pigeon, whether <laughs> I'm, you know, hired for a job in San Francisco or... Italy, I always keep coming back to Maine. There's something special about this place. Huh. But uh, so, yeah, growing up in Texas, I had a, about nine or ten years old. I decided I have to move to New York, and I'm either going to study architecture or fashion design. So, so at nine or ten, you knew, oh, like, yes. design is great. I'm going to do this. Yes, and my grandparents lived in New York, so I had the opportunity to spend summers oh, nice. and Christmases in New York. So, you know, once I felt that energy and that vibe and saw the break dancers on the streets, I'm like, this right. place is so cool. It <laughs> certainly beats the suburbs of, you know, Texas. Right. <laughs> so as soon as I could, as soon as I graduated, I moved to New York. But in order to make that decision between architecture and fashion, um, I remember I sketched a building before I ever sketched a dress. Hmm. Interesting. Yes. But then my mother took me to my first fashion show at the age of 11 um, at the Dallas Apparel Mart. And I saw, you know, the lights and the models and the audience. And I was like, this is exciting. I would, I would think personally, like I've never thought about designing clothes until recently, but it's, it's such a major part of our society, and it's a huge wow. visual part, obviously. I was just thinking about this the other day in evolutionary terms. Like, most all the other mammals have fur, and we've, like, gotten rid of our fur, but now we choose to clothe ourselves, and we design what we look like, you know? Well, That's it's similar to buildings. It's something that yeah. we, as a human beings, interact with every single day. Yeah, and we say so much through it. Right, whether you realize it or not. 
You know, yeah. you can say that you really don't care and you're going to have that disheveled look and you're <laughs> going to be a rebel or right. that you do care and you're going to be a sort of anthrop you know, anthropologist of design and wear something that someone else who has the same appreciation for a historical, you know, Harris tweed jacket is going right. to, you know, see and be like, ah, that that dude's got great style. Right. You know, so whether we realize it or not, these are subconscious choices that we make every morning. So uh, it's I find that fascinating. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> Yeah, I so so you made the choice to go to fashion design school. How how did that? I thought there were enough buildings in the world, and yeah. uh, I thought it would be um, a far more you know a, a lot more gratifying because it's an instant gratification. Okay, that's where that's kind of where I was going previ previously that I didn't get to scatterbrain. Um, that for me, architecture was very difficult. Uh, I have my master's and practiced for a couple, few years, but it was very difficult that the turnaround time was so long yeah. and so tedious with so much that's involved, the clients that are involved, the schedules, the budgets, the limitations, whereas the, the more free form and uh, s sweat equity investment that I could build my own business through photography doing that and have that quicker immediate gratification right. was huge, right. huge. N and not having to go to the same desk every day and work on the same project. So you found that similarly in fashion. You thought this could, you know, I could, I could do more designing and less, um, you know, constant attention to one project over yes. a long period. Yes, I mean, I literally was sketching buildings when I was... 10, 11, like mm -hmm. ridiculous designs, you know, yeah. like water coming down the middle of a skyscraper. You know, sure. <laughs> my father was always obsessed with Anne Rand and the Fountainhead. So, you know, Howard mm. Brork was like this sort of, you know, iconic figure. So um, in my spare time, I would take all, you know, vintage jeans and cut them up and make a tailored blazer out of it or a motorcycle jacket, you know, and that was <laughs> just for fun. But, you know, it was yeah. it was instant gratification, really fun and a really easy way to be creative. My senior year in high school, I got a hold of a sewing machine and made a lot of stuff and oh, spent a lot of time really? alone in my room making hats, shorts and snowboard pants a, like a out whole of surf line. It was it was a pretty ratty <laughs> thing, but I did make a pair of snowboard pants out of blue tarp material. Oh, cool! Because I needed waterproof ones, and I was like, I'll just make them, and I just wow. put a belt on. And wow! They were very loud when you walked, though. But <laughs> that's the thing about <laughs> those parachute <laughs> pants. <laughs> yeah. That would, see, that's that's another element of design that you have to think about when you are making a three-dimensional garment that's going to be worn by a human being. Right. I remember many, kids' clothes suffer yeah, from that. I mean, it's at, too thick. Well, I mean, but then at, it falls apart. at Ralph Lauren, we were doing a lot of those, you know, nylon pants, and we had yeah. to make sure that our nylon was really quiet. <laughs> oh, so it had to be a really smooth yeah. on the surface. At least, at least at the friction points. Right. Right. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, so quick turnaround and quick and turnaround. Moved to New York City. Went to Parsons. Studied my uh, sophomore year um, in Paris, which I encourage every American to do. I had never been to Europe before. I didn't know anyone. A full semester a full year. or year in a there. A full wow, year. That's nice. Um, I got lucky by just a couple, you know, piece of paper with some names and phone numbers. And once I got up the courage to actually cold call these people, they welcomed me with open arms. So before I knew it, I had a, you know, a great so community in Paris. Parsons, as part of its program, sends you over there for a year or? Yes. Okay. Yes. They, and they don't set up a place for you to be or? Um, I chose to sort of go it, you know, not to be so isolated and insular within the program. Yeah. Because the program itself, you speak English the moment you walk in the door. Hmm. And, you know, I, being the rebel that I was, took French <laughs> in high school and junior high school instead of Spanish. Yeah. Like, what on earth? What? Who are you going to speak French with? Because one day I knew I wanted to move to Paris. And, wow, you, you know, really envisioned this whole thing at a very young age. I did. I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> um, so, yes, I, I, I ended up getting a roommate who was not in the program. You know, she was studying at La Sorbonne, you know, Les, Pla Les Arts Plastiques, and, uh, you know, getting submerged in the sort of um, underground dance scene. Oh, right. cool. <laughs> so it was really a really special experience. But then I went back to New York because 
Parsons in New York was the place. It was the curriculum. Um, really, really strong, a military school for designers, really? literally. So, you know, that's where they really ingrained serious color theory and, you know, just trend forecasting, not probability theory, but, mm -hmm. you know, everything that you need as a designer, not necessarily to operate a business, but to understand the right. whole encompassing proportions and color and... Give me, like, the three-sentence... Uh, encapsulation of color theory three sentence like oh. as as short as you can truncate it like Less what is, is, more. What is <laughs> i i always like i approach my photography in that way like if i can make everything as you know to a degree monochromatic as possible and then the, and then, then the have pop. like some very selected yes. pops like yes. i that that to me feels yeah it's it's a very Muse like art museum aesthetic kind of like all gray floors white walls and then these pops that's how my but, own house is kind of but here's here's the secret like it can't be flat it can't yeah. be all monochromatic right like for instance when you're designing um i, I like i like this example because if you look at a really great looking um sneaker okay all of those elements are not the same color if they were they w it would look cheap you're, you're working with different levels and different tones of uh -huh. grays and neutrals, you know, and that's what gives it the depth and the character, and that's what gives it the quality, right? You know, uh, I have I have a really pressing question I have to ask you now. So my wife and I were in London for our 17 year anniversary like a month or so ago, and we went into Harrods, mm -hmm. big department store, and the high fashion. I'm I'm not very in tune with fashion really oh. um and like they're going for these god-awful shoes are <laughs> high fashion or something right and they're like, like mm -hmm. 330 some pounds okay. for yeah. the most ugly shoe it i've looks, ever looks seen like you, you're a club kid you just walked out of limelight in 19 you know 91 yeah they're like <laughs> a, they're like a 90s to 97 yeah. very marshmallowy yeah. white like yeah. What's the fashion theory behind that? Is is, is it just a cyclical like I, absurdity again, kind of thing? This is because we haven't seen it since the early then, '90s, yeah. and since it used to be a very fringe, a subculture trend. I mean, when I was going to Parsons, living in the East Village, you know, I knew all the cobblers that were making these shoes for the kids custom. Right. They would just glue on, you know, one sole after the other. So before you knew it, they had platforms that were, right. you know, six to eight inches tall. Um, <laughs> so, so again, the thing about the eye and culture and trends is that, you know, when you get sick of seeing certain things, you need something almost fresh a shock to shock you. Yes. Yeah. To yeah. Extreme. It's like that's shocking like, a hot tub that new. needs, uh -huh. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> that's, that's interesting. I, I love that it's cyclical and I love that they're, you know, it's kind of a rebirth of what was. But this seems to be the, these kind of shoes, these very ugly shoes to me. Uh, they're like a rebirth of something. Of <laughs> I get it. I get it to me. Th but they're like a rebirth of something that was never cool to begin with. Well, right? it was never really a European trend either. You know, it, was, mm. it really was a subculture, except in the 60s, like the Biba and, yeah. you know, back in, back in the, the platform days. And then, you know, London, the swinging London's, it, w it was sort of it was there it was present yeah. but not to not really what they're doing right now right now looks looks like what i saw in the east village in the early 90s but <laughs> but i mean they're taking like the it looks like a a shoe that the the when i saw people wear them previously they'd like lace all the laces too tight mm -hmm. and then the toe gets bulbous mm -hmm. you know and <laughs> it was like those were strictly comfort shoes and you'd wear them like if you were doing an eight hour shift as a as a waitress or waiter yeah. or something, yeah. you know, but yeah. now they're like on people's feet as like a, a statement of absurdity and like that shock that you're saying, yeah. which is just absolutely it's absolutely. cool. But like I look at it and it's kind of disheartening because I could never pull it off. Like I couldn't go there. I wouldn't you know? want to see you try. <laughs> <laughs> no, bad idea for but me. But, you know, it's appropriate for certain brands, especially European brands that are 
luxury that are working yeah. with the finest materials. So you can make something that is so absurd and so ridiculous, but with these gorgeous materials, right. it works, you know, That's and it's so a juxtaposition crazy. between right. those two that give it its, its dynamic quality. It's not just traditional quality, it's dynamic quality. Hmm. Whereas you look at a designer, you know, like, like Ralph, you know, Ralph, wouldn't put a big giant trendy platform shoe on his runway necessarily because yeah. he doesn't need to that's not what he's about that's not right. what his brand is about you know so he, he needs the freshness but he can interpret it in a little way you know maybe just right. add a little bit more of a of a, of a lift but gotcha. you know, not to the extreme not like right. a gucci or you know uh, okay so it it is really like uh what new england is to the u.s like you might have all these trends and differences throughout the country but new england's always a little slower tempered. to adopt it's tempered. they're it's they're they're more even like yes, yeah yeah yes. more classic um so going through design school and coming out okay. how as a as a person who then has their own at i would assume at the end of design school some very strong opinions as architects do when they come out very and they have an aesthetic that they gravitate towards yes very very much so and in, in my work at parsons my senior year was very rooted in symbolism hmm. and mythology which which putting a portfolio together <laughs> to market me as a graduate to the designers in New York on 7th Avenue. Right. Um, so you were looking to work in New York. Well, I wanted to move back to Paris, but being an American, you know, <laughs> I, I, I just, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I was a little, it was a little limiting. Sure. All I wanted to do was move right back to Paris. And, you right. know, I got an internship at Jean Paul Gaultier when I was there. But anyway, I really wanted to, I, I, I couldn't afford to. I had to work. Right. You know, my parents cut me off immediately <laughs> after graduation. They're like, good luck. Good luck. We know As you're going to do well. Texas parents will do. Yes. You know, it's, it's <laughs> yes. So, so my professors, my illustration portfolio professors made me, instead of doing my very creative work for my women's wear, they decided to have me put together a men's wear portfolio which my approach to menswear was very formulaic, you mm -hmm. know, more rooted in traditional classics, but with a pop and a twist. Like, for instance, my one concept was about Jim Morrison meets, um, Jan um, oh gosh, what's the name of the actor? The James Dean? Nope, nope, no, that would, that would be Jean not a juxtaposition. Um, oh, okay, um, so... The cri that Christmas film that we love so much. Oh, so much. Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart. Stewart. So yes. a real straight edge look. Yes, but well, that sort of the gentleman, but then yeah. with some Jim Morrison like sure. sex appeal. You know, right. like imagine, you know, those tweeds in the classic fedora hat, but with you know a fur trimmed mm. collar and, uh, a, and little, a, a little more and a little shabby chic kind 70s of seventies bell there, bell bottom. Yes, so that interesting. <laughs> Right, right. Or, you know, your Wall Street pen stripes, but then sort of taken into a sports theme, you know. Mm. So that's that's what I put together. And going and out of Parsons, I... Visualizing all that almost almost makes you taste it. It's weird. <laughs> like you're, you're playing with these very uh, iconic, to a degree, things that we pull from our past and then we bring them together and we just kind of spice them. Yep. Yeah, and, that's, and that's, make them new. That's a lot of the key to what th the nostalgia. Yeah. Those tiny little things that remind you of something. When you look at a garment or you walk into a retail space, those little subtle subconscious little things is what sort of, you know, makes you it stirs an emotion. It brings a memory mm -hmm. and it sort of makes you identify. Right. So interesting. So after after school, I interviewed with Tommy Hilfiger and let's see, um, Calvin Klein, and I ended up getting a job as an assistant designer in menswear for Calvin Klein. Oh, cool. Which was awesome. Um, it was 1996, so Calvin was on the top, you know, Kate Moss and yep. Marky Mark were in our marketing campaigns. And uh, I had a really cool team that was assembled. The director was from London, straight off the plane, and then the designer that I was assisting quit about three months into my, my, my role as starting as the assistant, which, by the way, when you're an assistant, yeah, you sit at the desk all day long and you do nothing oh. but sketch and tech packs. Tech packs, tech packs, tech What packs. are tech packs? Tech packs is when you um, basically spell out the directions of the garment, including all the fabric information, mm. all of the, um, the measurements, you know, the sizing, um, 
the sketches front, back, inside, the labels, the care labels, the, the thread count that you're going to use, the color of the thread, so the color the, of the buttons. You're, uh, in an architectural sense, you're doing the spec sheets of everything. Yes. It's pretty yes, much the same. Yes, exactly. Huh. So when the designer quit, then I had an opportunity to sort of step in and sure. start conducting the fittings. and get. Did the you see that opportunity? And you're like, all right, here's well, my chance. Someone had to do it. I right. <laughs> didn't want the boat to sink right. and it was an opportunity but they hired another designer he quit you know and they hired another designer and within 13 months I had seen three turnovers why know? why the high turnover you it think? was a hard place to work at that really? time yes I mean it was a revolving is door. that just typical of fashion in general it's pretty mm, high it depends high stress? on the company uh, but yes pretty typical especially during that time you know right. there was no work-life balance forget forget it yeah. we worked for you know 30 days in a row I remember I counted oh gosh. and these days in a corporate design company were from you know 8 30 9 a.m. until 1 2 3 in the morning and no you really? can't sleep in you have to be back at your desk Jeez. Yes. Yeah, so thank goodness I was really young so I you know I, it was not a problem <laughs> at all um, but yeah, I mean, when a meeting was scheduled for 5 p.m., sometimes the president wouldn't show up until 11 p.m., and you had to stay at your desk ready for that phone call. Oh. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, you know, we were a tight team because, I mean, besides the constant turnover, the ones of us that stick stuck around, um, right. you know, learn to entertain ourselves um, sure. and stay, you know, alert and ready ready to run into the conference room and deliver the boards and then go back to our desk and wait for the phone call to be like you know how much of what you guys would design and produce would end up going into production well that's a good question um, again back in those days we would really over design yeah uh, because we weren't quite sure what was going to stick and what was going to work right for instance um, and where would you get your initial direction from in in doing those all right, that's that's another good question. That's 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 the sorry to the take meat. it back a little further. Yeah, yeah that's that's the meat. Um, that would all begin with a, a concept design meeting where we would brainstorm for kind of like an upcoming season. An upcoming thing? season, yes. Right. So we would work way in advance um, with the team as a total, so everyone feels that they have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way I like to lead my teams, anyway. A sort of just um, it's a workshop, I would call it. Yeah, and. I encourage everyone to bring to the table things that inspire them. Right. If they want to sit down and sketch a collection or if they just want to bring in, you know, a color, a scarf or a silhouette that they found that mm -hmm. they think is, you know, going to be important for next season. And we'll go around the table and everyone has an opportunity to present their work. Everyone listens. And as as we're working, I'll sort of take notes or I'll start a concept wall based on the sort of linking themes. Okay. And, and do you pull from like the last season to like, we're going to take 20% of the last season and make sure, I mean, because every brand has their. Not at this initial creative kickoff. Okay. I don't want there to be, you know, any, any boundaries really. We'll get to that much later because okay. it's a lot, it's really driven by that too. You know, once our merchants come in and they give us the statistics from last season and what's currently oh, they, selling. Right. So they take the data from what sold the past yes. season yes. and you already have the overarching brand identity always in the back of your head. Yes. But then you, you've you designed or had other things designed in the past season. Then you see what's sold and you use that to inform the upcoming season to a degree. Mm-hmm. And that's really, um, you know, the design director's um, responsibility is to bring the newness. Because if you let the merchant drive the show, then they're going to basically put in the store everything that's been proven, that's right. sold in the past. And so and that's a temptation for money, but it's not yes, going to be the, what is the, the vanguard. Yeah, you got it. Because I, my point of view is like, yes, but our customer already has that in her closet. So She's not gonna what, buy it again. what yeah. are we going to do that she doesn't have? And what's going to attract new customers, but maintain our our current customer as well. Sure. So that's that's the delicate balance, hmm. and that's that's where the magic comes in. Interesting. And so, the as a design director, someone you at the time and Calvin Klein weren't the design no, director, no, no, I was but the you assistant were assistant designer. <laughs> the the best design directors. What were the qualities that they had in working with that team? You think that well, made them. Th that's exactly what I learned when I was at Ralph Lauren. I had some amazing 
bosses. Um, they were inclusive, including Ralph. Ralph was awesome. He would walk into the room, look around. If he didn't recognize you, he would point you out and you know, introduce himself. Right. So he knew pretty much knew everyone's name. And if you had something, if you were wearing something that he felt was appropriate that you know, looked good for the concept, he would also point you out and be like, That's, this is a look I'm going for. Mm. So I remember- Now was it seriously frowned upon to wear any other brand than Ralph Lauren? Not at all. No, it's, it, was all, <laughs> it was all in the way you mixed it up. Right. You know, we wore a lot of vintage, yeah. especially. Um, a lot of, you know, of course, when you're working at Ralph Lauren, you're expected to be like a character in a play, you know? Wow. When you walk in that door. No it's, pressure. It's, 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 it's like you're in a movie. Wow. You're in okay. Ralph's movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Interesting. And, and yeah, it's... And so it's you're, not, you're not just... It's kind of like architects designing their own houses, Every day yes. you're representing maybe the potential vision. Yes. It's it's like a subtle like, oh, what's so and so got on today and what's so and so like Yeah. Wow. And that's, yeah, I never that's, thought of that. Well, that's, that's that's the culture serious. that that you it, I think it's the best to create because you're inspired by each other. Yeah. And you yeah. look over and you see what, you know, this young, you know, twenty four year old that you just hired out of school is wearing and she's got this really interesting look on. It's still Ralphie, you yeah. know, but it has this really interesting sleeve detail. So we're all photographing it and sketching it. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. So sorry, you had the, the best design directors, how they worked and what they brought out. They were and inclusive. Everything. They were inclusive and they were interested in what the young um, designers, the assistants had had to say and what they were wearing. Mm. And they weren't they didn't operate from a place of fear, which is is hard rare. not to do, I imagine. <laughs> um, well, trust me, there was in, in the structure at Ralph, there, there were the checks and the balances. So you had that person that you had to please no matter what, or you were going to get, you know, axed. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> You'd run out of the room crying. Um, but as far as generating the, you know, internal team, you know, uh, motivation and creativity, you know, we're all on the same team. We're all on the same side. So if one of us looks great and Ralph is happy, then we all succeed. So, you know, my first Ralph meeting, I was barely with the company for a few weeks. And I had just gotten back from, so, so I, I, quit, I quit Calvin Klein after, you know, 13 months and just burn out, right? You lasted 13 I months lasted doing 13. the 9 a.m. to 1 a.m. <laughs> yes, sometimes three, uh-huh. And wow. then I decided I needed, you know, because I, I went straight from like hardcore school to straight to working. And yeah. I had never really given myself any time to, you know, explore. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go on a... I quit, went on a three-week surf safari nice. up the coast of uh, South Africa with my boyfriend. Oh, good thing you didn't get yeah. eaten. There's and a lot of sharks down there. <laughs> no. Um, so while I was there, I got the phone call from the recruiter at, you know, Ralph Lauren had a, you know, a, a designer position open. Mm -hmm. So I jumped at that. And of course, when I walked in the door after three weeks on a surf safari in South Africa, I really looked the part and they were designing, you yeah, know, yeah. spring, summer. <laughs> yeah, you probably came in with this fresh energy of like, yes. I've been in salt water for three months or whatever. And cool they're just like kind of looking up from their cubicle. <laughs> I had made my own sort of, you know, like linen pants on a, you know, sewing machine in the hills, dipped them in the salt water, you know, had a, yeah, a wow. nice, a nice little finish on them. So I happened to be wearing that when Ralph came in to look at the rig. And he looked at the rig and he's What's like, the ah, it's the rig. Okay, so rig wall, that's how mm -hmm. we began the concepts. So oh, it's okay. a very tactile way to um, approach the design, designing a collection. Mm -hmm. We bring scraps of fabric, we bring tear sheets, we, bring, we make sketches, we have you know, swatches of color, um, vintage garments. We tried not to use bought garments because that was just cheating. Mm. So you know, we'd even just pen you know, certain silhouettes in an, from an old, you know, Navajo rug uh, right. and say, that's going to be a camisole <laughs> or that's going to be a ball gown or something like that. Right. So he would walk in and he'd look at it and he could understand it. We'd have a rack of clothing outside, outside the door if we needed to bring it in, if he didn't like what he saw. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then we just work organically that way. So how much of a actual say did he implement oh, there. Oh, huge, huge. Huge. Some days he was not happy at all. And he mm -hmm. wasn't very pleased with that current. He just looked a little flat. He started looking around the room and he saw me. And he looked, what? I and mean, he like, goes, yes. he goes, 
that's be cool. That's be what cool. I want to look like. I was like, don't, don't, don't. Oh, no, man. oh my God, oh, all, all the, all the, all the team members are gonna hate me. I'm gonna get poison darts shot in my right. back now. <laughs> you know, coming from Calvin Klein, where it was really competitive, very different culture. Uh, but okay. that that was not how how they treat. They were just they were happy. They were like, they yes, take you we've and put got you in a glass box for a day or two and study <laughs> they you. Photograph or? you on three three D <laughs> photographs, and then they sketch you. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So um, <clears throat> so yes, yeah, so that's that's uh, that was a good example of of just inclusive leadership. Mm-hmm. Which, which was really great to experience, especially after a few negative experiences. Right, um, yeah. And then the next, the next process would be the meeting where everyone comes, sits, once Ralph approves it. So he approves like a, a, a vision. Yes. Essentially. And then yes. everyone goes away to create according and, to the vision. And one, another point I want to I wanna make sure that everyone realizes is that on this rig wall, we will have the house where this woman lives. We will have maybe even the car mm. that she drives. Now, at Ralph Lauren, at this point, were you specifically in women's wear? I or? was in women's wear, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I switched over at Calvin because yeah. I got bored. Yeah. So, <laughs> so on the rig wall, you'd have all that, but you'd also, at the same time, and we had spoken about this, you'd envision starting out the house where this potential customer Yes. lives. So yes. talk to me about that and why, why the house? Well, the house is what really dictates her lifestyle okay. and her aesthetic and whether she's going to be a minimalist and, you know, more like the, the Ralph line or the black label line, or she's going to be more of a bohemian, mm. you know, and which means if she's in the, you know, shingled, you know, sh beach house versus your, you know, um, Mar Roland Radzner, um, you know, modern, Ocean cliff, gorgeous, floor to ceiling window getaway. Right. <laughs> I'm in, I'm envisioning my own house right now and trying to think what I am because like half the time I'm in like a single jumpsuit out in the woods with a chainsaw uh -huh. and then we have floor to ceiling windows with a concrete floor and it's a very odd. But I like deal. I like that just position between the modern <laughs> lumberjack. You know that's what I'm going for. Anyway, I go that's for what gentleman farmer because like gentleman I have farmer. no need <laughs> other than I want to go out there Minimalist and make the job. area look nice. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not making food to sell. Like I don't have to do it, but <laughs> I'm out there just because I'm like, man, this will look nice if I do that, and this will look nice, and yeah. But. So so with these images that we find of the beautiful home that she lives in, it also helps to complement and dictate what the prints and patterns are going to look like and mm -hmm. what the color palette will look like. Uh. So it all sort of blends together to make this harmonious orchestra. And <laughs> so after vision meeting, Ralph comes in, kind of yeah. gives his take on it, yeah. approves things and kind of uh, formulates a vision for that season. You uh -huh. guys go back and take that and start to create. Yes. And then we'll sort of break off into teams and we'll sit with the design director by, by category, by product category. Okay. And what are the categories? Um, well, for instance, wovens versus knits versus sweaters. Oh, okay. Those are the biggest differentiators. Right. Um, and you have a, you know, each team is a sort of expected to be a scientist of each, you know, category. Um, and then with the wovens, especially, it's broken down into outerwear, tailored jackets, um, bottoms, which mm -hmm. they call rough wear. Rough uh, wear. Yep. So pants, but, but that, shorts. But that's different than the tailored pants. Yes. Okay. All rough right. wear is a whole other genre because you've got finishing techniques. You've got, you um, know, uh, it's a whole, it's a whole science of, of design that you'd never really think about when you no. walk into the retail store. It, it was really interesting to hear like behind the curtain <laughs> kind of stuff. So, so you guys break down into all these different segments of ways that people would close them, close themselves parts of, of yes. an outfit, yes. essentially. And by this stage, the design team of each specific category will have trays of fabrics that they've been researching or developments, like all kinds of brand new, um, you know, oh, mattress so plaids, for instance, uh, or, you know, if it's, a, if it's a preppy group, then you've got all of your bangle stripes or your regimental stripes right. and things like this. Or maybe they're just vintage that you just pulled out of the archive, but you think looking and based upon the rig will be appropriate and that you can interpret. Mm -hmm. So you've got a big jump start on your materials. Ah, okay. Okay. Interesting. And so after these uh, vision creative sessions where you break out, you create stuff, you come back for another meeting with Ralph at that point? Nope, nope, nope. At that point, we're, we're meeting with um, 
with the SVP of design and advertising. SVP? Yeah, senior, vi- senior vice president. Okay. But all again, right. this is all specific to one company. It's different sure. in every single company. But um, I think Ralph's um, whole checks and balances and system of, of touch points and meetings really worked mm-hmm. in order to produce the best product. Hmm. Okay. But it was a very product-centric company. So at, really at after that creative part, we knew then would go meet with the SVP. Would, do you think... And we'd had sketches prepared by that time. Is it only sketch fabrics? presentation at that point? Or yes. have you put to... Yes, but th- there are many meetings. Right, okay. So, you know, many internal meetings with the designers and the director over that specific sure. brand label. So, and the, it's that design director or creative director or VP, whatever you want to call her. Mm-hmm. It's her responsibility to make sure that all the designers who are focused on those specific little categories are making the right thing with the right proportion and the right fit mm. to work with the other pieces from the other design team sure. so that you get the whole head to toe look. Right. So, you know. Oh man, that's a lot to keep. It is. Oh, oh, oh it is. It is. So when all of your samples come in and you have to, you know, create your showroom, which is what, when Ralph comes back in to see. And when it comes back into showroom, you've got actual made garments at that oh, point? Oh, yes. Everything yep. is made and hopefully oh, ready wow, to go cool. into production or already has, depending on your timeline. How cool would that be, though, to be <laughs> Ralph and come in and give, like, the vision and then see the execution, right? you know, right? that'd be, like, oh, to yeah. just, like, all right, guys, I'm going to see you when you got product there. Oh, yeah. Oh yes, but you know they they would hold you accountable. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and Buff, Buffy was 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 the was r- what what Ralph liked to call his wife at work, but she was the one, the SVP, who would mm-hmm. make sure like it was really coming together before Ralph would ever waste his time to come right. in to see it. Hmm. Wow. And believe me, if it didn't work, heads would roll. <laughs> Jeez, the pressure. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if your if your shirts were too short and then your you know the waists of your pants were you know not high enough and you saw a little gap there, you were you were dead. Ooh, oh man. <laughs> so, uh, how but at long? Least we had a huge also a backup team like yeah. that were doing alterations for the entire week before showroom. So uh-huh. we would run through like a have our own internal fashion show with mm-hmm. models, try on all the looks together, make sure it all works together, make fit fitting you know adjustments, right. and then all of our sewers would just get get busy. So wow, yeah. So I'm I'm slightly aware of the process of making furniture on on a larger scale, and what they go through with concept, um, vision, concept, concept uh, mock up. Yeah. You know, and, and, and then like execution and, and everything else. And it's, it's interesting. It's just such, so much more of a grand scale on a, on a world influence level. Absolutely. You know, that's, that's pretty incredible. Absolutely. So how long did, you, how long were you at Ralph Lauren there? For this tenure, I was there for, I, I had two tenures at Ralph. This one was for three years. Oh, wow. And, you know, again, being a very curious minded young designer, young mind, I, I wanted to travel and I wanted to sketch all day long. You Do you know? think the, the people that are in charge of hiring and, and everything else at these companies really look at that part of a person's life and, I, and pull they, that in? And their personality, yes. I mean, I was rejected from, um, I won't say who, but right out of school, I was rejected a few times from some big companies for because you don't have lucrative life experience. jobs. No, because they said, you're going to be bored. And I can tell that you're not, you're going to be unsatisfied and you're probably going to leave within, you know, a year or two. Did I'm like, give me a chance. I need a job. Now, why, <laughs> why do you rent. think they thought you were going to be bored? They, they thought you were going to be in a cubicle here for too long and you're not going to, you're not going to want to do that. I guess, um, well, they, you can tell if someone, <laughs> you know, is ambitious and, and hungry and creative. Right. And, you know, right. Yeah. So. I, it's an interesting thing to me. The, um, Anytime I, I, I was such a bad employee. I, I have <laughs> always been such a horrible, horrible employee. I don't know exactly what it is about my personality, but I'm, I'm motivated if I'm interested in and doing my own thing. And I was a bad business partner. I was a bad employee. I was bad at all of that. And I, I don't know what it is, but I have to be doing my own thing and teetering on the edge of failure. Mm-hmm. And that inspires me. What, what's your star sign? I have no idea. Is that a... S- or, your, or your Chinese animal. Don't know. <laughs> Sometimes it all comes in, into play. A, pe- a lot of people <laughs> have asked me that. 
and I don't I don't know. I was born in June, so seventy six. Gemini. I don't know. Who knows? That's another conversation. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm a. I, I I like to solve problems and create things, and I like to be unaware of what's coming next. And yep. there there's a there's an oddity to my personality that if I don't feel like I'm being different, am different, or creating something new, that I'm not of worth. There's a there's an oddness there mm -hmm. to me that. You pushes like, me in some ways, but probably makes me do some strange things. You don't as well. like to stagnate, which I you. identify with, which yeah. is why I've taken a lot of risks in my career. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot. I mean, yeah, I, I think that's probably partially due to uh, different personality types, even along the conservative and liberal, just as a personality type, yeah. not necessarily political. But um, if you look into the psychology of the different it's very interesting that the, uh, and also it's interesting, the, um, a biblical look at it, if you will, there's kind of a priest and a prophet. Mm -hmm. A priest will be an individual that comes in to a system and turns it and, and maintains it in a way that keeps things Semitic. going perfectly mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. and that's a very conservative personality type mm -hmm. that is very good at the bureaucracy of the thing and, mm -hmm. and making it run smoothly where the prophet will come in and will like be disheveled with horse manure in a tear and, and be like, you're all doing this wrong. And you, and they burn him most of the time. Uh, well, or disappear yeah. into the, into the hills for 40 days. Yeah. 40 <laughs> days or they just, you know, burn him. But it, you know, they're, they're both such important parts. Yeah. And I think for a, um, my own life for a long time, I just kind of figured everyone was the same because I, I don't know why I still haven't figured that out, but I thought everyone was kind of the similar and I just couldn't understand how people could, made good employees, right, you right, know, right. How, they like, how are you doing this? Are you, are you just same. not shooting yourself in the face every night when you go to, how do you do that? <laughs> and yeah, it, it's interesting to grow up and, and to figure out things a little bit more. So the first tenure at Ralph Lauren yes, lasted Ralph three years. Three years, yeah, over, over three years. And I was um, poached away by a recruiter for a job a head offering hunter. me a headhunter, yeah. yes, offering me a lot more money, um, a senior designer title. And the job required me to be on a plane to London to go shopping and trend spotting before I even sat down at my desk in New York. So and I that said, was very exciting. That to was you. so exciting. Yeah. Um, needless, to, needless to say, it was for a fast fashion company mm -hmm. um, that I, after one year of working there, I kind of felt that I was almost a prostitute <laughs> mm. of creativity and yeah. that there wasn't much of a brand identity and it was just about churning out product of whatever it would sell. So there wasn't much mm. of a backbone or spine right. of integrity. And it okay. was like, you know, quality, they didn't care. They just so wanted anything that would sell. Talk to me about the differences between those. Like, so you're saying that like with a uh, Ralph Lauren type of brand, mm -hmm. there was a company vision that, while it could move to a degree was unchanging and and, and uh it was a foundational thing Foundation. where this other brand was kind of at the whim of whatever whatever will sell we will create yes and the the different feelings you had at the at the two i mean you're still making clothes that people well, wear you know like, what's interesting is that there was a motto back at ralph lauren back in the day i don't mm -hmm. know if they still have this but it was design driven mer or design led merchant driven so meaning design leads the vision yep. but the merchants drive the machine sure so it's kind of like your prophet and your priest okay <laughs> it really is you know the merchants are there with they know the business they know what they need to fulfill their business objectives and the design team is there to bring the magic and the vision and you know to foresee what's going to be hot you know in 12 months 15 sure. months sure. you know two years from now so we have two different roles and there's tension between the two teams constantly mm -hmm. as it should be <laughs> as it should be yes but you know again they we aren't set up to compete with one another we're set up to succeed together right right it, it, it to me it's very much reflects what a healthy political environment would be yes. that the conservatives are there for a reason and for a good reason and so are the liberals. Yes. I wouldn't want to live in a completely conservative country or a completely liberal right. country. Right. One's going to be a socialist dictatorship and one's going to be a religious oligarch or whatever, you know, and it's going to it's going to go bad. Mm -hmm. um, so 
talk me through a little bit. It's interesting to me that the the degree at which you felt you were prostituting out your creativity in this other one. Uh, talk me through that a little bit more. That's interesting. Well, at, at this particular company, the merchants created their own very commercial line on the side by okay. by pulling items from factories that already existed in someone else's line. Mm. Yes. Okay. And then design would create their own, which we would start with sketches and tech packs and send those to a factory to get those made. Of course, that would take more time right. than the merchants just pulling off of someone else's line sure. or going shopping and buying samples and having them knocked off. Right. So, you know, watching that happen and then watching, you know, having all of your time that you spend creating a line and if they don't buy it, then you're sort of like, what am I doing here? Why did mm. I just waste all that time creating something really cool that I think is cool? Right. But, right. you know, the buyers aren't buying it. Huh. <laughs> Interesting. And that kind of company was throwing around the money to try oh, and get yes. the talent to see if they could do something. Yes. But they weren't sticking to where they were spending that money. That's they right. were they were kind of just blown by the wind, if you will. Like they would just throw so. anything on the wall and whatever stuck. That's what they put in the store. Hmm. So interesting. <clears throat> um, I've often thought it's a, it's an interesting, uh, it's interesting making a living as a creative, in that you're not, you're not uh, managing something else. You're not, you're not doing something outside of you. You're taking something from inside of you. You're taking everything that you've experienced, and I do believe that creatives, if you think of it in photographic terms, have a little bit wider aperture in their whole experience. Like yeah. everything that's out there comes in. Now, a wide aperture in a camera means the hole that the light goes through is really big. So ev everything's coming in, and that's a lot of stress on the film or the sensor. It's a lot of information. I, I think creatives have, in a way, metaphorically, a larger aperture, and they maybe aren't an expert like some people can be at a single thing, but everything comes in and is a little more connected from that. And somewhere in there, you're taking that huge amount of information and you're turning it into something that pulls from all these experiences of life and you're giving it back. And that's also why I think there's this kind of uh, manic kind of like spike of creativity and then downtime spike yep. of creativity yep. and downtime because it exhausts so much yeah. out of you to right. connect all that and then to give it back. Yeah. So you work for, you know, 13 months or three years and then you go on and a three month, I got to get out, you uh -huh. know, um, or longer, <laughs> or longer, a couple years. So, and yeah, this fashion cycles today, that's why there's so much burnout in the industry. You know, we're expected to refresh and renew every eight weeks, a brand new, fresh collection for the floor oh, set man. you know and when you're doing four runway shows a year you know you never stop like, and yeah. you're working on usually a crossover of three seasons all at once <laughs> Jeez. yeah yeah so, so you you went to this other so brand I went to the other brand were and you then based in london for that no or? no no new york new, new york. york and uh and then i was again recruited away by a headhunter for another senior designer role but this was for a company that had a similar aesthetic to Ralph Lauren, and it was being head up, headed up by John Barbados and Neely Lotin, who also used to work for Ralph Lauren. So it yep. was like returning to, to, the, to the flock, to the tribe. Yep. So um, I took it. <laughs> like, I'm coming home. Um, and, it, you know, Nautica. It's, it's, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, no, no. yes. So, you know, I've always been a big fan of all things nautical and maritime. And so... Uh, so yeah, so what, but while I was at um, the fast fashion company that gave me the, the money to start buying my own sewing machines, and I had a big loft in Brooklyn, in Williamsburg, and I started just setting up my own design studio mm -hmm. and making stuff on the weekends. And my friends were photographers, so we do creative photo shoots together, and it was while I was at, was it, yeah, Nautica that... The f one of the photographers was like, hey, one of my friends has this very cool shop down on Orchard Street. You know, I'm going to take all the clothing that you made for the shoot and show it to her. And maybe she'll place an order. So sure enough, she did. <laughs> I'm like, nice. wow. All right. So I guess my cool, you know, um, recycled Coke bottle fleece sweatshirts that, you know, the fast fashion company didn't want to buy right. are really cool. And, you know, so she placed a little order of, you know, five pieces. I went home. I sewed them myself. 
put them in the store, and within a week I got a phone call from a store in Japan, and then another phone call from a, you know, a, a young designer showroom that wanted to rep me. So I was in business, but I still had my day job at Nautica. Bing, bang, boom, <laughs> off you go. <laughs> so I hired a seamstress to basically sew while I was at work in the daytime. So I would get home from my day job as a senior designer and oh, check the work, clip, you know, clip the threads or and then cut the fabric to prepare, you know, the next set for her to sew the next day. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So where's the where's your ideal dream job in all of that, you think? <laughs> I mean, is, is your dream job being Ralph Lauren, essentially, to, at the oh. peak of that? or? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. in hindsight, yes. And, and of course, I, I went back to Ralph. I'd still go back to Ralph. But he, I love him. He's my family. Yeah. <laughs> so what... I feel like I have a duty <laughs> <laughs> to the legacy. <laughs> must must go back. Well, we'll tag them in this interview. I'm sure they'll be um, So y you start... You so start yes, this yeah. kind of I small company on the side. Where did I you go with that? And how did that side. feedback, how did that give you that feedback? And what did you do with it? Um, well, it, it was right around 9-11. Oh, yeah. My first fashion show. I produced a fashion show in White Columns Gallery in Chelsea the night before 9-11. So that you had the fashion show yes. the night before. No one at work knew about it. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was doing all of this on, on the weekends and evenings in my spare time. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. And I, uh, my mom flew in for it. You know, it was the, all my friends were there. The press were there. You know, all the buyers were there. I'm like, I'm going to get an order from Barney's. It will really, you know, boom. Well, the next morning, you know, the Everyone towers. Everyone forgets oh, about it. man. It was like it didn't even happen. Yeah. But yeah. I, w I, I actually spent the night in the West Village, so when I woke up, I still had to return the lights from the fashion show, so I was on a mission. I told my best friend Simone, like, take my mom out for breakfast. I got to go to work. I've got a fitting at, at you know, 9.15. I got to be at work, which was all the way uptown. Right. So I jump in a cab, and the cab driver is all freaked out. It's like, I'm like, what's going on? He's like, no, I don't take you downtown. I go, you're going to take me wherever I tell you to take. I got to get these lights returned, and I got to get to work. You, you didn't know <laughs> what was going on? I didn't know what was going on yet. So we turn the wow. corner, and I see the towers are burning. You know, so wow. then I'm like, oh, I still managed to get over to the West Side Highway before they shut everything down to return the lights. <laughs> and then we're, you know, we're going uptown to 57th Street and they start shutting the streets down. But still being the New Yorker, determined New Yorker, I'm like, I've got a fitting. I have to get to it. So I jumped out of the cab, thanked him very much and jumped on the subway, which was still running and got up to work in time. And, you know, we watched everything unfold um, yeah. on the radio and then in the conference room. And then, you know decided to walk back down to the West Village, down Fifth Avenue, which if you're familiar with New York, is grounded, used to be grounded by the Twin Towers. Mm. So there I was in the same outfit I wore to my fashion show the night before. <laughs> right. Watching the towers just already had collapsed and burned and just wow. all, the, all the smoke billowing up, you know, yeah. just, just with the only the mission, just blessing all the souls that I saw flying into the sky, but also, you know, just had to get back to my mom. Right. You know, I'm sure... Right who was terrified, you know, she just flew up from Texas. <laughs> Jeez. So, yeah, it was I, my wife had flown back from somewhere in New York on the 10th. And I think she was at, I think she was at work. Were we married? No, she must have been in school and I was in school. But yeah, I think someone came. I was in the structures class in architecture school and someone came running in crying. And we we're just like, what is going on? And then, you know, everyone was around a TV the rest of the day. Yeah. But. Well, we were stuck downtown. They wouldn't let us leave. I couldn't go back to Brooklyn because the bridges were closed. Right. We could barely go above um, or below, you know, where we were in the West Village. Hmm. So, and there was, there was only, the only traffic was, you know, the bombers going, flying over, over our heads. Right. So there we were just trying to exist and chill and, you know. Calm down. <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> so that, that, had get, you know, Something like that really makes you reevaluate how you spend your time and, oh, yeah. and the, your quality of life. So I decided, it, I mean, I didn't quit right away. I um, took a, a vacation, a one week vacation, and I took my collection to Paris for one week and I did a renegade fashion show on the street. What's that? <laughs> During fashion week. 
So I'm like, Talk well, me I'm through going that. on vacation, guys. And I packed up my collection in a bunch of suitcases and took my good friend who was a stylist and my other friend who's a photographer. We jumped on a plane and uh, put together a renegade show. Basically, I, I had no money, right? Maybe a thousand bucks. That's it. Right. Um, and a lot of that was flying my friends over. Sure. So I looked at the fashion week schedule and I looked at the designers and where they were showing at w- and at what time of day they were showing. Uh, so I was like, marketing who's going doing. to have the audience <laughs> that will, you know, be in line and appreciate my collection? Sure. And what location could we actually set up outside of? And Does make this it actually work? happen a lot? Do people do this kind of thing a lot? Or is it well, just I'd never heard of it back. Yeah. This was, 19, was sorry, 2003. So yeah. I'd never heard of it before. I was just trying to be creative. Mm-hmm. And this, this was the collection was all about um, power. Yeah. I was doing a chakra series collection. So oh, cool. So this one was the third chakra, which was about power. I was like, what would be powerful? Well, to have a, a real mm-hmm. renegade show in Paris, that would be pretty powerful if I could pull that off. So why not? I have nothing to lose. Yeah. You know, let's just do this. So, um, so yeah, we chose, we chose the right designer, Yoji Yamamoto. He was showing at the end of the day, which means people wouldn't be running out the door to catch another show. Mm-hmm. And it was at Le Petit Palace, which had a beautiful green lawn in front of it. So what did you do? So, well, we casted models, you know, f- free, free. They were w- willing to work in exchange for dresses. And oh, my f- so they, the stuff they were modeling, they get to keep? No, no, oh. no, because those are all my originals. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> I had extras. Um, and if I didn't get you anything, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hit me up. There's my email. I'll send you something. I've got plenty of samples next door. <laughs> um yeah, so we, I, I, was luck, I was fortunate because I still had friends in Paris that I met while I was in school who were makeup artists, hairstylists. Um, you know, I was connected to some fire dancers, so I called them up to see if they wanted to, like, you know, twirl some fire. And we had a, a branding ceremony. That was the concept of the show. Interesting. So the models weren't just standing there because we didn't have a runway. Right. So what we did was I had a, um, a cattle iron made of my logo, and, you know, the fire dancers were spinning the fire and they pretended to heat, heat it up. And then each model would co- come out of the circle and be branded somewhere. <laughs> you weren't actually branding no, no, models. No, 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 not, though, a, right? not at all. But it was, it was, No you know, models were harmed in the branding. It was um, an interesting, you know, performance. Yeah. And, and it certainly got att- the attention. All the press started setting up their cameras. I was interviewed afterwards. Nice. I was featured on the news wow. between Mark Jacobs and Tom Ford. So, you know, that was exciting. And I still had my day job. So I came back and I was like, you know, yeah, I mean, bursting. We saw you on the news. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, so needless to say, I quit, I quit my day job. And, and my boss at the time, Neely Lotan, I remember what she said to me. She goes, you know what? You can either stay here and make money or you can go out there and be poor. It's your choice. Everybody wants to work here. Look at those resumes on my, t- on my desk. And I was like, Neely, you know, I love working with you, but I, I have to do this. This is my opportunity. I have very little overhead. I have no chil- she children. She was really you threatening know? you and trying to kill your well, she dream? Wanted, she just wanted me to stay. You know, she didn't want to have to start to hunt for another designer. So I was like, I'll I stay as know. long as it takes for you Henry to hire Rollins, someone Henry Rollins, <laughs> you know, Black Flag, Henry oh, Rollins? Yeah, of course. He was scooping ice hearts. cream. And I think Black Flag, if I'm getting the story right, Black Flag lost their head lead singer somehow. And he had known the band somehow or something. And he's 31 flavors scooping, you know. And the, uh, they, they hit him up and was like, hey, you, we need a lead singer. And we know you know our songs. You want And he had, I don't think he had done, ever done anything wow. like that. And he's like, uh, and he told his boss, you know, at Paskin Robbins or whatever he was at. And the boss was just like, follow your dream and knock that out of the Evin Park. Do it. Awesome. You know, you know, I used and to have a crush on Henry Rollins. <laughs> he's an intense dude, <laughs> but he's a, he's an informed and uh, thoughtful guy. It's yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah. But, you know, I thought that was a, you know, people get few opportunities in life and. I don't know. I well, just, it's so guess short. Guess who has her own line now? And she's very successful. Your, your old boss? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is very cool. You know, yeah. when, I, when I left, I left all my tear sheets uh, by her door with a note that said, always follow your heart. Right. <laughs> so, so you left not Nautica. 
I left Nautica, yeah, and I went on on my own and struggled and struggled, you know, just bootstrapped the whole way. Didn't know how to sit down and write a business plan at all. I didn't have a partner who was that, you know, compliment to me. I was mm -hmm. doing everything yeah. on my own. And, you know, I'm the kind of person that starts, you know, I, I was making my own labels. You know, I was printing everything, silk screening it in-house. Mm -hmm. I was silk screening my own prints on fabric. <laughs> I was doing everything. So, um, you know, and but the thing is, my, my first collection delivered to the stores right after 9-11, and it sold out within three weeks. So clearly, the, it had an emotional pull, and it, right. I was doing something right. So I got more reorders. So my cash flow was based on the stores paying me in time, and I would take that money, cover my overhead, buy the new materials for the next collection, and I, you know, operated like that. Wow. So one little hiccup, one store not paying me on time Ouch. would just screw up the whole machine. Right. So you, the stress involved was, was incredible. And, you know, when you're running an, a business, you're managing a team, you're managing production in-house. That was another thing. I looked for manufacturers to produce the garments, mm. and they wanted to charge me um, for the sample, the same price as my wholesale price. <laughs> I'm like, that's not going to work. That doesn't help. No, no, no. So I was stuck producing everything in house. Wow. So managing production, uh, but I was still making enough. Thank God I had really, really, really cool landlords who were also artists who understood if the rent was late. They were like, okay, we get it, Ashley. We know. I'm like, see this $15,000 order? Once they pay me, once I finish it and I deliver it, you know, I'll be able to pay you the rent that's due for two, three months. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, really, thanks, thanks, Lee, Simon, and Eve. <laughs> Couldn't have done it without you. Um, so, anyway, successful, especially from the exterior because I mm -hmm. was getting press um, and write-ups. Um, and then I opened a store... A pop-up shop in Alita that was super successful. It was small. It was on a tiny street. Anyone that walked in would probably buy a dress, you know. And maybe we had two or three people that walked in a day, and that's it. Mm. So I'm like, wow, well, that worked. I should get a bigger store. So I found a space in Soho on Green Street between Prince and um, Spring that was 4,000 square feet. <clears throat> It was a basement, but it still had window on the street level, right, right. next door to Louis Vuitton and, a, you know, and Anna oh, wow. Sui. That yes. couldn't have been cheap. Four, four, five grand. Yeah. Which was cheap. Super really? cheap. Yes. The, the owner gave me a deal. But again, it was a basement. <clears throat> Stella McCartney is there today. <laughs> hey, <laughs> there you go. Anyway, so I walked, I, I, I renovated the place myself. I did all the scraping. I built all the fixtures. Yes, yes. I had a, um, a dressing room that was essentially a teepee, you know, made from a wire hoop and tree branches. <laughs> Good idea. Oh, and uh, we were very, I was very creative about the way I designed the space. The workspace <clears throat> was over to the right, which I, using tent poles, stretched some white fabric over and lit from behind. Mm. So when you walked into the retail space, you could see the people on the sewing machine sewing because they were lit so from behind. So in your shop, you were making the clothes that you were selling. Yes, yes. Oh, that's pretty cool. Very cool. There's there's a lot of. Uh, so a lot of that today, but back then. There's a sentiment of like, oh, whoa, this is made right here. Yeah, in 2005, it wasn't a thing yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so so I called that the womb, you know, and then behind that was where I had to design my office and you know, the giant table where we'd print all the fabric. Did you do specifically women's, women's and men's, women's and um, kids? What were you doing? Women's. Women's? Women's. <clears throat> um, and then the retail space, you know, was all very creative. Again, all mm. the fixtures made myself and nice. tree branches hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> um, but, you know, after being the cook and the, you know, hostess and the cleaner and, you know, having to not only <clears throat> design the collection, manage production, manage and motivate a team, uh, do window displays, refresh the assortment. Jeez. Uh, I, I sort of neglected my wholesale business, you know, when the phone rang, I'm like, I don't have time to answer the phone. Right. You know, uh, and then, you know, at the end of the day, I had no time to spend with family, friends or, you know, forget about it. No social life. Yeah. So, you know, I just sort of I leaned out and uh, 
said, all right, I think I've got my honorary MBA by now, and nice. be nice to kind of go back to the industry and get a steady paycheck, have health care. <laughs> she can't afford to have health care right. when you're bootstrapping it. So <clears throat> personality-wise, what have you found creatives? There's, there's this thing where you'll run across people who I generally find creatives are very great at being creative, but it doesn't always come or maybe not even all that often come with the kind of drive and vision that you're that you possess it's it's most commonly that a very creative personality will be really good at being creative but maybe not so much at uh starting running operating uh, a business right mm -hmm. that you know i've run into people who are crazy talented but to get out there and do it and start a business and make it happen is a different, typically a different skill set mm -hmm. um, that isn't always naturally paired together. Oh, it's an entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. You know, and again, you have to be willing to take risks and you have to, um, you know, um, I don't know why I, I, that's inherent in me, you know. But I mean, you were the nine or 10 year old that had the vision of like, that's what I'm going <laughs> to do. Like, which is kind of nuts. Yeah, I think I, I had great parents. You know, my mother especially really wanted to make sure that as a female, I had vision and that I could, I was going to have a career before I had a family. Mm. She regretted that later. She did? <laughs> yes. She was like, you listened to me you too, and you, you know, you took, took my it, advice took way far. too far. <laughs> it's time to stop, come home, get married, have kids. <laughs> right. I was like, no. Yeah, that that's a hard thing to to juggle. I imagine um, having all of those aspects of your personality and and being a woman in that uh, stereotypically women find uh, fulfillment through relationships and family far more the, than achieving at work. And this is obviously not an all or nothing thing. It's a bell curve stereotype. Yeah, yeah. there's always outliers. You're an outlier. Yeah, which most people are looking to be called outliers a lot and that's those are the people we look up to and everything but it also comes at some kind of cost mm -hmm. you know and uh how how have you dealt with and felt that part of your life is, as far as balancing relationship family and everything else while being such a high output on the creative business entrepreneurial but then the other parts of your life well i recognize that i think i was what 32 33 by this stage of my life yeah. and I thought if if and I did I went back to work for Ralph phone rang they had a eagle eye view position as a director overseeing five brands you know specific to a category that sounds like a lot of work too <laughs> yeah 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 but specific to you know the woven shirt category okay and soft dressing for instance women's mm -hmm. so that was appealing to me because I would be able to work on all the brands, you know, Black Label, Blue Label, Rugby, Golf, Double RL, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> and work with all the creative directors over each brand, you know, which was fascinating. Yeah. So, and plus, you know, being that, working that close with Ralph in tandem f and seeing his input for each distinct oh, label interesting, yeah. was also really interesting. More of a view behind the curtain, if you will. Exactly, I would think. exactly. Yeah. So people were like, "How could you go from having your own brand to going back to, to Ralph to working on a specific category?" That's why, because it was appealing to my my broader vision of business and fashion and branding. Mm -hmm. So um, I loved my job and I loved my team and I, I loved actually having a budget given to me that I could work with. Right. <laughs> I'm like, no piece of cake no problem i can throw money at this problem <laughs> and it will be solved i know how to do something on a shoestring you mean yeah, i right. can get to fly first class this is awesome uh, <laughs> nice. uh, are you sure i'll fly the coach and i'll take three of my student my my designers with me right. <laughs> oh so so yeah i started doing that and literally about four months later i met my um ex-fiance it and i started commuting to maine on the weekends yep. so i had my weekends off and I had my boyfriend, so I'd jump on a plane on Friday night, and then I would be in Maine and Portland until Monday morning at 6 a.m., and I'd hop yep. back on a flight. You'd fly out of Portland? Uh-huh, yeah. we do New York to Portland or Portland to wherever a lot, and yeah, it's, it's interesting flying out of Portland a lot, but 
totally different subject. <laughs> so that <laughs> so that was three nights in Portland, Maine, and yeah. four nights in New York City, and I did that for three and a half years. Yeah. Until I decided, okay, Ashley, you really need to get serious about you know your personal life, and if this is the man of your dreams, you need to live with him. And there was no way he was going to move to New York. Yeah. So I um, yeah I quit the job I loved and I moved to Maine. What did what did you do when you? Because I remember when you landed here in Maine. Because yeah. I I know your ex fiance. Uh, yeah. And what what were you doing when you landed here? You I'm. I started making stuff like you know leather handbags, little medicine bags, and it was kind of a reset them. and a relook at everything that you're doing to yes, like. Yes, and right. I still had a lot of dead stock from when I had my store too. Right. Okay. So I started selling at all the craft shows, the maker, you know, the maker shows, the picnic mm -hmm. and, you know, the big thaw and other interesting, you know, small designer shows just directly to the customer, which was so refreshing because when you're working for the big companies, you never meet the customer unless you hang out in the store. Oh, okay. And interesting. you're so yeah. busy, you don't really have much time to, you know, sit right, in the store. Right. And, you know. <laughs> so it was, it was just so awesome and refreshing to get that instant gratification when she tries on the dress and she loves it and right. you know, she smiles. So um, needless to say, I got a call from a recruiter, had another headhunter for the job out in San Francisco. So that, uh, but I still cut my studio here. Right, and you still have it. Yeah, and I still have it. <laughs> yeah, we we did not used to be neighbors. We actually took that wall out and are now neighbors. So, <laughs> but, um, so how long were you out in San Francisco for? Um, about almost two or three years. Yeah. Yeah. How did you like living in and San Francisco? Oh man, it's one of the most beautiful cities. Yeah, it as far as American cities go, I think it's the top for me it but is, i just hear it's so crazy expensive it is crazy expensive i mean i i was fortunate because i was you know i had a really really lucrative job so yep. i got a beautiful apartment right on top of telegraph hill with nice. a wraparound balcony and a view of the Ooh. water and the bay you know i could just walk down the filbert stairs to work i mean hummingbirds were on my balcony and coming into my nice. you know apartment it was just beautiful i love how hilly san francisco is and on the bay and yeah. So amazing. Yeah. But, you know, being the risk taker that I am, and uh, I was at that stage where I'm like, midlife crisis, I'm right over here. Come over, just land right on top of my head. <laughs> I just need to We're just all there. <laughs> change everything. Sure. So quit my job, put everything in storage, broke up with my fiance, and started my, you know, eat, love, pray tour of the world. So and from that's San where Bali Francisco. comes in. You remembered Bali? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So how long were you in Bali for? Um, not long. I mean, I was there full time for three months, Yeah. you know, which for me was a long time. Did you ever get to surf Padang at all? Or? Of course. Are uh, you kidding? That's like, that was just, that's better. <laughs> I, I've been to the Menawais out, you know, further out in Indonesia. But yeah, I I doubt I'll ever go to Bali because it looks so crowded in the water now, though. It's like so many people You have to go to the right go time now. of year. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, that spoiled me. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so from, from San Francisco, you eventually ended up in Florence, was it? Mm. Uh, Benetton or? Yes, but not directly from San Francisco. So I went from SF, traveled down after I got back from, you know, my tour, um, hung out in SS, SF for a little while. I mentored some upstarts, you know, in Silicon Valley, you know, bio, Mentored companies some that, that are doing wearable technology oh, who, okay. cool. you know are geniuses when it comes to coding yeah. you know and engineering but they've never made a garment before no clue right yeah. right so yeah. that was really fun oh i um, bet that's a that's a totally different kind of taking what you're an expert at but yes. then like oh well all right so yeah exactly uh, can you talk about any of those things or are they still kind of under an nda or something um, well, yeah, well, <laughs> I'll take that as an NDA. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so then I, 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 I found myself gravitating towards the warmer weather in Topanga Canyon in Los Angeles, set up a studio there, but then I s still was coming back to Maine, you know, <laughs> every month or so I'd come back and then move back here, um, for a little while got married and then got the phone call literally a few days later that I got the job in Italy as head of design for Benetton. Wow. So, and that, 
th that position, is that overseeing the entirety of their line, essentially? Yes. Yes. Wow. So we're talking, you know, 1,200 items a season, <laughs> four seasons a year. Okay. So you can imagine how, how do you feel at the end of the day after you've just seen one mm. garment and one, yeah. you know, Oh, yeah. I can compare that just to... Belt the, after the other. Yeah. You'll, with some of the videos that we edit, you'll have to just sit down and go through song after song after song after song. And you're looking for just that you're looking for the feeling from the song that fits with the video you've edited yes. and created. And that repetition of that subject matter, man, after mm -hmm. a while can. And so, yeah, the level at which you're doing that yeah. to yeah. every garment you're looking at, you're you're keeping the seasonal vision, the company vision, yeah. like all of those visions are in the back of your head, sitting there on shelves and you're referencing them all for every single garment. Exactly. And, whew, I imagine you start to do that though at an emotional level to where you can just look at a garment and you feel the information mm -hmm. kind of interacting with what you know the vision is. Absolutely, but try um, communicating that to a team that doesn't speak English. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and Mucho. you know I took French so you know my Italian was not not up to par I had a full-time interpreter but still there's so much that gets lost in translation so yeah. it was a challenge so how did Italians being Italian and you know great designers in their own right obviously yes, yes. feel that an American was coming in and well Benetton is a very American brand yeah you know if you're familiar with with they when they were an in American their, when they're, when they're uh, well if you're familiar with their advertising yeah. and the color and yeah, the, the color diversity and and the boldness and yeah. the, the way that they used to take risks that's not Italian oh I see what you're saying you know? okay because I view the quality, Benetton as the quality being was very a Italian. European type of brand well it is it's well, that's why the the justification okay. of the two is so okay. good mm. so good you know? all right so um so how was it working with Italians? Did did you feel some pushback? Oh, at it all was or? a completely different culture than mm -hmm. working with an American team. How so? In, in America, you you try to create an inclusive environment, mm -hmm. you know, and you lead by motivating. Okay. Whereas in you know Italy, it, it's different. It's more directorial, and they're waiting for you to tell them what to do. Oh. Where okay. I'm like, no, I want you to use your brain. I want you to show me something that I'm gonna. I'm going to be impressed by. So they so really liked that. So they're looking for like top-down creativity that's rather than... That's not what they were looking for when they hired me, but that's what they were accustomed to. Okay. Yes. So they... Mussolini, baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting because my, my father teaches uh, at a university level uh, conflict management and church leadership, uh -huh. which when you get into, like, religious leadership, that's a weird thing, but... Um, it's interesting to hear him talk about the different types of leadership. Like he'll go to Russia and interact with their types of leadership that they have there. And it's very, very much a top down strong man. They love Putin there. The country I does. Know. They, they, do. they, they love actually, Putin. they love they him <laughs> and they feel he's a strong <laughs> they, leader. You they know, they young, beautiful girls that have crushes on Putin. Oh yeah. He, it's a very top down kind of thing mm -hmm. where, all the models for, um, and it's weird how it blends into religion these days, but the, the models for leadership, as you're kind of saying, is far more uh, spread out and communal now mm -hmm. in, in business modeling. I was talking to a client I have about this kind of thing, and that top-down thing is kind of just starting to do this, where mm -hmm. it's, you know, there's a, there's a directing to a degree, but it's not a you know, I'm just going to sit here and wait for you to tell me what to do and then I'm going to do it. And there's one person that's kind of, you know, a dictator. Mm -hmm. So it, it's interesting. And, and to hear about some of the, like in Africa, th my dad was saying that they had, they were having problems with alligators eating village people, but the local church that he is kind of affiliated with that denomination the other religions in the area were kind of saying uh, we can't kill an alligator. It's a spirit animal of this, that, uh, and the other, mm -hmm. where like the, the religion that he's associated India. with was a little more scientific, if you will, and understanding that it's an animal and it's not that big a deal. But how do we find, um, you know, a way to deal with this rather than killing the animal? Maybe we can, you know, somehow figure out how to build a well away from the water so it so the people don't keep going towards the water's edge where this thing is. And 
he can explain it a lot better. But <sighs> different leadership types, very interesting yes. how people lead. Um, so how did you how did you feel adopting adapting to that and and well, leading in that kind of situation? Well, um, it's more about how they adapted to my leadership style. Yeah, you know, uh, because and and for the most part, it was refreshing because they'd never really had that much direct contact with the head of design before. Really, and I, you know would look at them and actually ask some questions and I was open to hear their feedback. So mm. they weren't prepared for that at so first. So they weren't getting that before. Oh no, 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 no. And we won't talk about the way it was before too much. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but yes, it was, it was a, it was a big challenge because of the communication style mm -hmm. and, um, I mean the, the language, the one, yeah. the communication barriers, um, and, and the leadership style, but it was, it was, um, very interesting to see the dynamic change in the way it really brought their spirit out. Hmm. Did you see them adapt to it and flourish because of that? Yes, but there were other issues within the company that had nothing to do with design. It was, um, you know, it was, it's a great, amazing brand, but the business side of it had basically an antiquated business model mm. that um, was not set up to compete with the companies that we were being benchmarked against. Okay. So uh, a lot of the new companies out there, like their Uniqlo's <laughs> or not so new, um, Zara's and H&M's, they're not so new anymore, but those are vertical business models. And they're able to sell their clothing at a certain price point that's so low because they cut out a lot of the middlemen. And even, you know, with companies like Uniqlo, they, they own their, you know, raw materials. Like they, they own the cotton fields, <laughs> you know. Wow. So a lot of those... Really? Middlemen are, are and all the markups are just oh. reduced. Um, so like I, I think Forever Twenty One, and uh -huh. I think at the main mall, it's it's one of the stores that you can get out of mm -hmm. to the parking lot directly through the store. You know, like a J.C. Penney's mm -hmm. kind of used to be. I don't think they own their own raw materials. I think they just have very low margins. Well, yeah, <laughs> like I, I remember that's, walking that's through and like I looked at one of and it was like $4 for something that you would think should be like at least How long 50 did it bucks. take someone to make that? I'm just uh, wondering like how on seconds? earth can they do that? <laughs> I know, yeah. I know. It really blows your mind when you think about it, but it's... Um, disposable, yeah. it seems. And it's like. disposable and it's causing landfills to fill up. You know, it's not sustainable hmm. at all. So anyway, uh, it, it was frustrating being benchmarked because guess who gets the squeeze when you're benchmarked against someone like, you know, Zara, yeah. who's selling a tank top for $10 when we, we can't produce the same exact tank top for less than 25 because yeah. of our wholesale model, right. right? Guess who gets the squeeze? The raw materials and the design team because we're forced to, to work with subpar materials so oh, okay. so the fabrics that's the major cost mm -hmm. and of course they'll allocate the production to whatever factory gives us gives the cheap cheapest price which means the quality will suffer right but guess who gets the blame and the fingers pointed at design <laughs> designs weren't great this year so <laughs> so you know there i was at the table the only person at the table of executives who did not have an mba and I'm the one saying, oh, our business model is antiquated. <laughs> we can't compete with what we're benchmarking right. us against. But I couldn't, I would, would I, I want to, this is why I want to go back and get my MBA. I, I can't prepare a solution and present the solution. And sure, I don't, sure. I don't like to present problems unless I can pre present a solution. So, hmm. so it was a, a really interesting learning, uh, learning experience. So, so where do you see yourself now and going? I know you're on one of your in-between kind of things that are Maine. refreshing. You're back I'm in back Maine. I'm back in Maine. I'm having a blast designing yacht interiors. Oh, that's right. And helping my friend um, Kate gable Saramith grow her business. Yeah, so we should get her in here to talk too. Because that's a yacht design. Should. That's a, yes. that's a interesting take on like take the house and just make it smaller and more detailed exactly <laughs> exactly and and it's it's part of my you know it's in my yeah it's my Nautica toolkit and, it's my, and ralph and lauren yeah. i mean these are the these are the, the customers i used to design clothing for so right, right. you know it's the I, the aesthetic i get completely right. so it's been a real joy so with uh yacht design are you working with like the yacht companies or are, do you do them s with consumers both, actually both. So. Kate, kate has a lot of yacht companies that she designs for mm -hmm. and i the one that really is the 
customer facing. I'll go out and visit their home, you know, oh, present design cool. boards, have, you know, interactive creative meetings with them, picking the prints and patterns right. for the interiors. Um, Kate does that, that as well, but um, I'm able to travel more since I don't have two little boys at home. Right, right. <laughs> um, I have two really little boys at home. Really support, support her in that area yeah. and hit all the boat shows, you know, and network. So fun. Oh, I mean, uh, <laughs> boats are, yeah, that's, that's a, it's a bit of an addiction and I wish I earned, you know, millions of dollars a year so I could have a boat that I could just go around the world on. That'd be great. Yeah. But reality. One day, one day, <laughs> once the kids are out of college, they Keep can, they can buy, they can buy you that boat, Trent. Right, right. <laughs> if train them right, they're going to be very successful and they're going to buy dad a boat. <laughs> Um, so do you think so yeah, that's been, that's been floating my boat, <laughs> um, while I do research on my next move. So, you know, I've been, uh, looking into MBA programs Yeah. and, uh, you know, at Parsons, they, we didn't take, um, probability theory. We took color theory, right? <laughs> we didn't no. take statistics. We took trim forecasting, you know, uh, it's a, it's a different ball game, but, yeah. um, I, I, I'm going to have to, uh, you know, take a few courses in microeconomics and right. statistics and brush up on all of that. So, you know, when people ask me, like, like when I left architecture, I felt like I was leaving like eight years of my life behind. Like I just, Oh, I wasted those previous eight years, but it's not no. like that at all. No, it a hundred percent is a factor for where I'm at now yeah. and influence everything that I do. Now, that being said, if I were to go back and do it over, I'd still take architecture school because I think it's an incredible education. It taught me how to think aesthetically, uh, composition yep. and everything else to think about light and yeah. what it does, which influences my photography and, and videography. Um, but I would want to get more of a business background as well because I have that entrepreneurial side of me. I wish I understood more of that type of information uh, and wish I had that to a degree. Um, I'm, I'll never go back to school though because I absolutely hated school just about as much as being employed. <laughs> but, no, but I actually really enjoyed architecture school because that was a different deal. Um, but when people ask me, I'm, I tell them, go to school. Like when people ask me, what should I take if I want to be a photographer? Should I go to photography school? Because you didn't and blah, blah, blah. And I usually tell people, study the subject matter that you want to mm -hmm. shoot. Mm -hmm. Because then that gives you, you an go. informed position on what you're capturing, right? Yes. Yes. So like if you wanted to become a photographer, I'd imagine you'd have a lot of idea of how to shoot Yes. clothing and fashion things. You'd, yes. you'd bring a unique eye to it if, you, if yes. that's where you wanted to go. Um, so I generally tell people, yeah, study what you want to shoot. And then also you're pretty much, regardless, you're going to be self-employed if you're a photographer. Yeah. So you should try and get some business background as well. And that's interesting to hear you start definitely. to say that. that oh, definitely. That's something that you definitely. wish you had a little bit more in your wheelhouse. Absolutely. So. Well, I think that's just, just <clears throat> like I said, I got an honorary MBA by running my own business and being so curious while I've been working on the design side for these major international companies about the other side of it. But at this stage of my career, it would be you know interesting not to pivot and change industries, but to be able to jump over to the other side. Right. Well, you know, and I think I would, I would be a huge asset because mm, you know, yeah. to, to drive the business, CEO for instance, one day, you know, but understand the design and, and, and the real product. Because at yeah. the end of the day, you're selling a three-dimensional product to be worn on a body. Right. And right. if you have someone who's um, leading the company who doesn't, who only looks at spreadsheets, you know? It's, yeah, yeah, there's, it's, a, there's huge a disconnect. disconnect. Yeah, man, I'm, you would be so marketable. Headhunters would just be <laughs> knocking down the door. <laughs> well, this has been a really interesting conversation. I really appreciate you taking My the time uh, to My come and, and, you know, draw back the curtain on, on that whole aspect of design and, and that um, market. I mean, that, that is, that is really interesting. And I've never really thought about it that much until like the last year or two, uh, you know, how much goes into just the design and thought and what you're wearing and branding and logos and everything else. It's, it's very interesting. So thank you so much. My um, pleasure. My pleasure, Trent. Thank you. Yeah. And if you <laughs> want to get the article that you will, will be writing, we're shooting this in earlier in the year. And then the, uh, the, uh, article that you'll be writing on design theory will be coming out in the i believe
believe, November issue of Main Home Design. Check that out Excellent. in Main Home Design. And uh, Ashley Tyler, Taylor, am I saying that Tyler, right? Tyler, Tyler. Thank you. Good. I got it. <laughs> Ashley Tyler, thank you so much for coming down and talking with us. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Trent. Thank you.